Hi, I'm Lou. <laughs> now I've got the giggles. Hi, I'm Lou. Does the idea of teaching other people knots get you in a tangle? Do you know your hitches and your bends? If not, fear not. In this video, I'm going to share with you the key terminology around knot tying, as well as seven tips for sharing knot tying skills with learners at Forest School. So knots are brilliant because they enable you to do all sorts of different things outside at forest school, like making a rope bridge or a rope swing or lashing together a picture frame or making a necklace. Knowing the right knot for the right job is kind of crucial when you're making things and doing things out in the woodlands. As a forest school leader, I would really strongly recommend you get to grips with a few useful knots that you're then able to share with the learners. On this channel, I'll be making a series of knot tying tutorials for individual knots, but in this video, it's more overarching. We're going to be looking at certain terminology so that we all understand the language of knot tying. I'm also going to be sharing with you some tips that I found useful when sharing knots with learners at Forest School, because after all, we all learn in different ways and there's lots of different ways of tying a particular knot. <laughs> so the first thing we need to know is get to know our piece of rope. If you look in a knot tying book there's a whole vocabulary associated with the rope and knot tying. If we are sharing this information with other people it's important that we've got a language to speak in because if I suddenly go well you take this bit and you shove that bit through there it can be very difficult for another person to follow so knowing the language can really help us teach these skills. So first of all, you've got the rope itself or the cord or the string that you're using. So that's often referred to as the line. So that bit's your line. Then you have the end that you're using to tie the knot. That's known as the working end because it's doing all the work. Then the middle part of the rope, the, the main length of it is called the standing part. And then the other end that's not involved with the knot tying at all. Well, it's got several names. It can be the standing end, but it's also known as the dead end and also the bitter end, if you ever wondered where that term came from. So we've got the working end, the standing part, and the dead end or bitter end. Then we can also make different shapes with the rope to help us tie a knot. So the first is when we make ourselves a loop where we've made a circle in the rope and the ends cross. So that is the definition of a loop. We also have a bite, not a bite, but a B-I-G-H-T bite. And that's when you pull up a fold of rope. So that's different to the loop because it's not crossing, it's just a fold hanging parallel. There are several knots that are tied on the bite, which means that you can pick up a fold in the middle of the rope and tie them. Some knots also involve going around sticks or branches. So if you are asked to do a turn, then that means you go around something just once like this. If you're asked to do a round turn, then you continue all the way around. I've just broken the branch. <laughs> Sorry, branch. Sorry, bugs. <laughs> just do that bit again. <clears throat> if you're asked to do a turn around a branch, that means you just wrap it around once like so that's with your working end. And if you are asked to do a round turn, you keep going all the way around another time. So that there is a round turn. So that is the proper terminology for these things. However, if we're working with learners at Forest School, we might want to change the vocabulary to make it more appropriate to their needs. So for example, if I was working with early years children, maybe instead of using that formal language, I might say that this is Sid the snake and he has a head at one end, which is the working end. He has his belly, which is the standing part, and he has his tail 
at the bottom, which is the dead end or the bitter end. So we can then use stories about Sid the snake to tie the knots and maybe that's more accessible for that sort of learner. We could even put Sid's face on the working end there so we know which end is the snake's head. Also, not all knots are knots. When is a knot not a knot? There are screams in the woods. <laughs> I hope those are happy screams. So not all knots are knots as well, just to add to the confusion. I'm using the word knots to incorporate all sorts of knots and bindings in all sorts of different ways, a generic term. But technically, a knot is only a binding on the rope itself, like an overhand or a figure of eight or a stopper knot of some sort. That, by definition, is a knot. As soon as you tie a knot to something else, like a branch or a peg or a hoop, then it doesn't become a knot at all. It becomes a hitch. And there are lots of different hitches out there, like the round turn and two half hitches, or the clove hitch, or the rolling hitch. So if something's got the word hitch in it, it means you're attaching a rope to something else. Then there is when you're attaching two pieces of rope together, and that's a bend. And there are lots of different bends as well out there, like the sheep bend. So when you're connecting two lines together or the ends of the same line together, you would want to use a bend. There are also lashings where you want to firmly secure things together like poles and posts, such as a square lashing or the shear lashing, the diagonal lashing, the tripod lashing. And finally, there's also whippings which is when you want to bind the end of a rope or the end of a pole or post together firmly and securely. So not all knots are knots. So I'd like to share with you seven tips that I've learned over the years that can help you share knot tying skills with your learners at Forest School. So do remember Forest School is a play-based learner-centered process. So it's very unlikely that you're gonna get a whole group of learners all wanting to tie the same knot at the same time. So the way knot tying is usually shared at Forest School is often on a one-to-one -one or small group basis as and when an individual finds a need for a particular knot. So perhaps you've observed a group who are shelter building and they're struggling to attach the string to the sticks or to the tarpaulin and you think, ah, you know, if they just knew this particular knot, then that would move them on and progress their learning hugely. So if you know those learners and you know where their skill levels are at and their physical skills are at, then you'd be able to subtly and gently share that skill with the individuals if they want to learn it. So tip one is only share a knot with learners when they've got a reason to use it, when they've got a purpose. Otherwise, they're probably not gonna be interested. In my experience, knot tying's one of those things that are one end of the spectrum, some people really, really love knots and they're right, really geeky about the knots. And on the other end of the spectrum, people struggle to tie their shoelaces and get a bit fearful around knots and not being able to tie them. So only introduce them when there's a purpose and a reason and an application for them. Two is know your right handedness and your left handedness or your bossy hand and your spare hand. And as the practitioner, be prepared to be able to teach knots, both right-handed and left-handed, because your learners may be both, or perhaps they're ambidextrous, or perhaps they haven't yet decided which hands they prefer. Three, when you're teaching a knot to somebody else, do make sure you're carefully observing them to see how they're following you. And sometimes there are different ways of tying the same knot that learners will naturally 
fall into. So some people naturally cast their loops on top, whereas other learners cast their loops behind. So neither way is wrong, but as the practitioner, you need to check which way that they've done it to make sure that the knot is tied correctly. Four, think about the size of the rope or the cord that you're using, and also the sort of material that it's made from. Certain ropes and cordages are easier to learn on than others. So for example, the bigger the cord, the easier it is to tie. Whereas the smaller the cord, the more fiddly it is and the more dexterity learners are going to have to have. Also, certain ropes are braided and woven and these are much easier to kink into loops than other ropes that are just twisted in a hauser lay, which is a three strand spiral. They kind of sometimes kink in the way that you don't want them to. <laughs> Five, if you're working with learners who perhaps have less strength in their hands or are less dexterous, then use the ground as a platform so that they don't have to hold the rope up whilst they're tying the knot. This way they can use also the larger arm muscles and shoulder muscles to move the rope. They could even work in teams or pairs to tie the knot together. Six, some learners are very visually orientated and so having pictures of step-by-step -step instructions of how to tie the knot can be really helpful for those sorts of learners so they can refer to them and go through things at their own pace. Seven, you could also use stories and songs. Sometimes that really helps learners memorise things. Uh, I'd like to share a story for the figure of eight knot that one of my teenage learners shared with me and he said it was the strangle granny knot because he said you made granny's head which is when you cast the loop you pick up her scarf which is the working end you strangle her with it and then you poke her in the eye and then you tie the figure of eight not sure what that sort of suggests about his relationship with his grandmother but it, it worked for him to remember how to tie the figure of eight knot so find different methods that work for different learners so remember at forest school the key is observe the learners find what works for them and be able to facilitate that kind of teaching style to them and that's only possible if you really know the knots yourself. So really play with the ropes, get to know them, get to know the knots left-handed, right-handed, on the ground with big rope, with little rope, in all sorts of different ways. Have you got a favourite method of teaching knots at Forest School? Let me know in the comment section below. If you've enjoyed this video, do give me a like and a subscribe so you can join me in the woods next time. Knowing knots can be a handy skill to make rope bridges and swings to give you a thrill. Start by learning the knots till they're a breeze and remember the best place to play is to the trees!